When officers arrived, they went over to the location of the green bag. Sheriff Bobby Vance crouched down to look at what was inside and literally gagged. The officers then cut the bag open and there was the naked, decaying body of a teenage girl. And due to her advanced state of decomposition, the girl was pretty much unrecognizable. The coroner claimed the body was of a young, white teenage girl with reddish brown hair. They said she was somewhere around 16 to 18 years old, five feet tall, and had no other identifying features. But the exact COD was hard to tell. There were no bullets, bullet wounds, slash marks. There was some discoloration on the right side of the victim's skull that almost looked like she suffered a whack to the head, but it didn't seem like that's what caused her to pass away. This led the detectives to believe the assailant hit her in the head and stuffed her in the green bag where she ultimately lost her life due to lack of oxygen. At the time she was discovered by Wilbur, examiners suspected that she'd already Already been lifeless for two to three weeks. But after the autopsies, coroners still weren't able to help the cops identify this girl. Typically, testing the victim's fingerprints would be one of the first things detectives would do, but unfortunately, the girl was so far into the decomposition phase that no fingerprints could be taken. The story of the corpse's discovery spread around town and people didn't like that the victim's name was unknown. So what else did they do than come up with a terribly insensitive nickname, Tent Girl? A sketch artist was hired to draw the girl's face, and that sketch was plastered around town in hopes she would be identified. Officers got a lot of leads about missing people who'd look like the girl on the flyer, but detectives went through each and every lead, slowly ruling them out due to inconsistencies in details like the victim's height and hair color. Filtering through the leads, there were a few that stuck out to investigators. One was about a girl named Doris who went missing while hitchhiking south from Maryland. Another was a statement from a truck who was driving on the highway nearby. He said he saw two hitchhikers around the area the body was discovered in. One was a guy, one was a girl, and they both struck the driver as odd because it was rainy and they weren't wearing the right clothes. The detectives thought maybe the hitchhiker was Doris. That lead became pretty hot because someone else called the police after that saying he picked up two hitchhikers on April 14th who also weren't dressed for the weather. Okay, has anyone stopped to think these people may just not have rainy attire? If they're hitchhiking, they could be traveling through and just weren't prepared for the rain. So this caller said the hitchhiking couple was fighting in the back seat, so he legit pulled over and was like, y'all need to get out. The arguing is just too much. Police tried to find more information about the couple, but before they could, they were informed that Doris had returned home and was reunited with her family. Another promising lead had to do with a teen named Debbie Crane. Debbie matched the description of the unidentified victim, and she was reported missing on March 3rd. Third, two months before Wilbur discovered the body. Debbie was last spotted getting into a blue Chevrolet Corvair with her boyfriend. No one knew where she went after and the timeline of her disappearance could have matched up with the case. But based on the autopsy of the unidentified girl, that would mean if it were Debbie, she may have been held hostage for a month or so, which was not off the table. So detectives brought Debbie's parents to the station to look at a sketch and see if it was a match for their daughter. When Debbie's mom looked at the sketch, Sketch, she almost fainted. That's how much it looked like her. But the closer she looked, the more she noticed a few minor differences. That had to be a really sad and weird day for Debbie's parents. So officials were able to obtain Debbie's dental records and they loosely matched that of the corpse, but that couldn't be confirmed 100%. Detectives also showed the corpse to Debbie's mom and aunt in hopes that they could identify her. Again, the state of the body didn't allow for a positive ID to be made. How awful. Even still, it seems to me that a lot of people did think that the girl was Debbie. If they went through the trouble of comparing dental records and showing the body to relatives, there had to be a lot of detectives on board with the identification. But one day, they received an anonymous call from a man who said, Debbie Crane ain't that tent girl. You want to find her, go to Bradford, Pennsylvania. She's as alive as you are and then he hung up. Shocked and confused, one of the detectives made the drive to Bradford and the caller was right. Debbie was there living with her boyfriend. Like she didn't think to tell her mom or one friend or someone. Apparently, 
Debbie's boyfriend promised her he'd find them a place to live if she left with him. So that day, she was last seen in the blue Chevy they drove straight to Pennsylvania. When the detective found this out, he sent the couple home and it was back to the beginning with the investigation. Although police weren't getting any more hits from missing persons cases, they had sent off the tent bag, rope, and a towel from the scene in hopes that they'd find out more information about where those items were from or who they belonged to. But the reports came back and all the material was common and could it be pinned to a specific manufacturer or anything? Well, before the victim or suspect could be named in this case, another crime happened that was spookily similar. A 16-year-old girl named Candace went missing from her home in Philadelphia in early March. There was a huge search for her, and eventually a group of fishermen found Candace floating in a creek one month later. She was stripped of her clothes and wrapped in a bag that was tied up with a rope, just like the body Wilbur found. It was apparent to investigators that they needed to look into this very closely because they might be dealing with the same part. In Candace's autopsy report, medical examiners said there was no identifiable COD and noted discoloration on the right side of the skull. Those were the same findings in the other girl's autopsy. The two victims had also been stuffed in the bag, tied up and dumped in a very similar manner. But detectives weren't able to find out much information about the perp and in turn, nothing new about the body in Kentucky. So another sketch of Tent Girl was drawn with a few slight changes to her facial shape and features. A bunch of leads came in, but they were all weeded out one by one. By then, the body of the unidentified girl was in such a bad state, no more evidence could be collected or determined from it. So officials had her buried in an unmarked grave at Georgetown Cemetery. She had no headstone at first, but a bunch of locals who were really invested in the case raised money to get her one made after the fact. The headstone had the police sketch of her at the top with the text, Tent Girl found May 17, 1960 on U.S. Highway 25 North. Died about April 26, May 3, 1968. Height 5 feet 1 inch. Weight 110 to 115 pounds. Reddish brown hair. Unidentified. Dang, that's so sad. Anyway, years passed and it really seemed like the case would stay cold forever. But wait until you hear this. Wilbur Riddle, the man who initially found the girl, had since retired and moved away from the Georgetown area. Well, his daughter, Lori, started dating a guy named Todd Matthews, and one day she brought him over to meet her dad. The two got to talking about the case, and Todd became extremely invested in the story of Tent Girl. Like Wilbur, he still wanted to provide this girl's family with closure after all those years. So Todd decided to review the case and see if there was any new information or leads that were missed on the initial investigation. Todd and Lori eventually got married, but they had some relationship troubles because Todd was so committed to solving this case. He was looking at other missing persons reports, reading all of the old newspapers, FBI notes, everything. And when Todd got to the part about the white towel, he read that specialists at the FBI lab thought the material of the towel was very similar to a diaper or towel for babies. So Todd started to speculate that maybe this girl was older than detectives thought she was. He wrote a letter to the police to present his findings, as well as the theory that Tent Girl was older and may have had a baby. Todd asked officials to exhume her body for another autopsy because they would be able to tell by her pelvis if she had given birth before, but they never got back to him. Over the years, Todd continued to seek answers and he was super committed. He visited the grave site hours away and talked to the local newspaper to see if they had any updates on the case. When 1992 rolled around and people started talking about this thing called the internet, Todd thought he might be able to use that as a tool for this case. So he started saving money and finding made enough money to buy a computer. Todd used his new computer to look up missing persons cases and search throughout online databases like the Doe Network, which helps identify missing people. While I commend his dedication, it seems like Todd wasn't paying as much attention to his family as he was to this case. His young son often complained about him always being on the computer, and he spent quite a bit of money on his research too, but it was all about to pay off. So one day, Todd was scrolling through missing persons websites about to fall asleep 
asleep when he saw something that caught his eye. It was a post about a girl named Barbara Westbrook who went missing in the Lexington area in 1967. As Todd read on about Barbara, he knew she was Tent Girl. They had the same hair color and height, the timeline matched up, and so did the location. So the poster was written by Barbara's sister, Rosemary. Todd emailed Rosemary and tried to get more information about Barbara to confirm that she really was Tent Girl. Rosemary said Barbara vanished in December of 1967 when she was 24 years old. At the time, she was married and had one kid. Barbara's husband was a carnival worker, so it was probably hard for her family to get in touch with them. Some of Barbara's relatives had no idea she was missing for years. And another one of Barbara's sisters said she reported Barbara as missing, but her husband said she'd run off with another man. After speaking with Barbara's family, Todd was certain this was the woman that the police had been looking for all along. So he went to the authorities who exhumed the tent girl's body. Her DNA was compared to a sample from inside Rosemary's cheek, and it was a match. Finally, the poor unidentified woman could be remembered by her real name, and her family would get the closure that they deserved. As I speculated, Barbara's husband, George Earl Taylor, is the main suspect in the case. He had since passed away, so we'll probably never know. But most people think it was George because he was known for being aggressive and impulsive. He worked for a carnival, and the green bag Barbara was found in was similar to material used in carnival tents. And she was dumped on the highway to Ohio, which is the state George's family lived in. While we still don't really know what happened to Barbara or why, I'm so glad that we finally know who she was. This case was one of those heartbreaking stories that seemed to have no end in sight, but thanks to modern technology, there was a resolution. It's crazy to think that if Todd hadn't been scrolling on his computer, that day, Barbara may never have been identified. So if you ever find yourself reading about or watching a video about a missing persons case, a quick share of that post might go a long way. Well, that's all for now. Thanks for watching. Welcome back to another episode of Killer Bites. My name is Lucy, and today I'll be telling you about the highly mysterious disappearance of Lynette Dawson. Lynette Sims was born in 1948 in the Australian state of New South Wales. When Lynette was a teenager, her parents sent her to Sydney to an all-girls high school. Lynette's school often threw events with the neighboring all-boys high school. And in 1965, at one of these events, Lynette Sims met Chris Dawson. They were both 16 years old, and soon the pair began dating. After high school, Lynette decided to pursue a career in medicine because she wanted to help people, so she chose to study and become a nurse. At the same time, she got a part-time job at a child care center. And when Lynette and Chris were just 21 years old, the two high school sweethearts decided to get married. That's where Lynette got a job at a local hospital. Meanwhile, Chris pursued a career in professional rugby. Things seemed to be on the up and up for this idyllic family. Both Chris and his identical twin brother Paul played professional rugby together. And in 1975, the two brothers were even interviewed during an ABC documentary program, Checkerboard, to discuss their professional rugby careers. So the couple had a seemingly good marriage and successful careers. So when did things take a dark turn for this Australian family? Well, it might have started after Chris and Paul ended their rugby careers and started new vocations as physical education teachers. But things were not as they appeared. See, Chris and Lynette had dreamed of having a big family, but they were struggling to conceive. After six years with no success, the couple had even begun to consider adoption. But before they had finalized their decision, Lynette finally got pregnant, and the happy couple welcomed their first daughter into the world. And if that wasn't enough, just a short time later, they welcomed a second daughter. The couple was so relieved to finally have a budding family, and their small family seemed ideal to friends and acquaintances, but this is really where the story begins to take a dark turn. Lynette's friends and family began to notice the appearance of bruises on her body periodically. When confronted about the injuries, Lynette claimed that it was nothing serious, and she told her friends not to worry about her. But although her relatives were worried, they didn't see what was happening as something that they could interfere in. See, in the 1980s, domestic violence was treated in a much less serious manner. Moreover, most who knew Chris considered him to be a loving husband and caring father who didn't show signs of aggression, which clearly we now know is not a factor in whether or not someone is abusive. However, this was enough to keep Lynette's family and friends from interfering. But had any one of Lynette's family or friends taken these early signs of abuse more seriously, maybe things would have ended up differently for her. Or even if Lynette had an outlet or a place she could go to speak about her experience. 
But like we mentioned earlier, at the time, there were not a lot of options for women in these types of situations. So most people around the couple just hoped that Chris and Lynette would work it out privately. And like many could have predicted, the relationship between Lynette and Chris only continued to deteriorate. If you want to hear more true crime stories, like and subscribe to our channel, Killer Bites. And now back to the story. Lynette noticed that Chris didn't seem as attracted to her anymore, and she worried about the future of their family. As it turned out, these concerns were valid. A few years prior, Chris had hired one of his 15-year-old students to be a nanny for his young daughters, but she didn't stay in the job for long. She would recount years later that she witnessed Chris hitting Lynette twice and then promptly decided to quit the job. After she left the job, Chris offered the babysitting job to another one of his 16-year-old students, Joanna Curtis, and it would come out much later that both Chris and his brother Paul had allegedly engaged in illicit behavior with female students at his high school. So I'm sure you might be able to figure out where this is all going. And not long after Joanna started working for Chris, his young student began to have problems in her family, which led to a very disturbing suggestion. When it was revealed that Joanna was having issues at home, Chris invited Joanna to move into his family home. Chris justified this action to Lynette by implying that this would be beneficial to the couple. He suggested that now Joanna could spend more time looking after their children. But Lynette was against the decision. She was deeply concerned about the problems her and Chris were already having in their marriage, and Lynette was hesitant to have someone, especially a child, present while the couple tried to work through their marital and more abusive issues. But Chris pushed Lynette hard on this issue, and in October of 1981, Joanna ended up moving in with Chris and Lynette. If you're feeling like this is a really bad idea, you're not wrong. Things are about to go way downhill for Lynette and her family. About a month after Joanna moved in, Lynette discovered that Chris was sleeping with her, which would imply that he had groomed and then taken advantage of Joanna. Regardless, Lynette kicked Joanna out of the house. Lynette was desperate to keep the family together for the sake of their children, and Chris's disturbing behavior got even more disturbing and alarming from here. Just a few months later, on December 3rd, 1981, Lynette was faced with another blow to her marriage. Chris left her a note saying that he intended to leave the family. He wrote that he was going to move to another city with Joanna and asked Lynette to not portray him in a bad light to their kids. Lynette was devastated by his proclamation and was convinced that this was the end of her marriage, and perhaps it might have been better if it was. However, a few weeks later, Chris returned home. But was he there because of a change of heart? Not exactly. Chris returned to Lynette because Joanna had changed her mind about moving to another city with him. So when he returned home, he begged Lynette to take him back, or at least let him come back home. Still hopeful to save their marriage, Lynette agreed. Unfortunately, this break in Chris's relationship with Joanna was not the end of their affair, and Chris and Joanna continued to date. And on New Year's Eve, Chris went off with Joanna and left Lynette alone with the kids. This was a devastating blow to Lynette once again. At that time, Joanna had moved into Chris's brother Paul's house. Paul lived on the same street as Chris, so Joanna was able to stay close by. And despite everything that happened, Lynette was still desperate to keep her family together, so she decided to enroll in family therapy. Chris was against therapy, but Lynette persuaded him to try anyway. The couple went to therapy right after New Year's, and according to Lynette, it seemed to have a positive effect effect on her marriage to Chris. Chris began to spend more time with her and even showed some desire to repair the relationship. Well, that's quite the twist. Or is it? On January 8th, 1982, Lynette called her mother to tell her that the family therapy was going well. Lynette told her mother that she planned to meet up with her and her other family members the next day at Northridge Bath. While on the phone, Lynette's mother thought that her speech sounded a bit unclear, indicating that perhaps Lynette was but when Lynette's mother asked about it, she told her that Chris had prepared some cocktails for her, and her mother thought no more about it until the next day. See, Lynette would never arrive at the beach to meet her mother and her relatives. In fact, she would never be seen again by her family. Startled by Lynette's absence at the beach, Lynette's mother tried to call her at home. Instead of reaching Lynette, Chris answered the phone. He told her mother that he had driven Lynette to the bus stop that morning. When asked where she was going, Chris told her that Lynette said she was headed to return some clothes that didn't fit. But he then said that she had not returned home after that. So where was Lynette? Well, that night, Chris called Lynette's mother and said that Lynette had phoned him. And apparently Lynette told Chris that due to their marital problems, she needed to be away from home for a while. That's a strange twist, considering her consistent desire to work through their issues. Despite all their issues, Lynette had up until this point always showed a desire to stay together with Chris no matter the circumstances. So what changed with her? Why did she decide to leave now? Or had something else happened to Lynette? One way or another, Lynette seemed to just disappear. And Lynette's relatives were convinced that she wouldn't just abandon her family, but they were also aware that the couple was having problems in their marriage. Still, her family could not imagine Lynette leaving her two daughters. She was a great mother and loved her children more than anything, and she had never once mentioned the possibility of leaving. As more and more days went by without any word from 
from Lynette, her family began to fear for her safety. But every time they would want to go to the police, Chris would claim that he had heard from her. On January 12th, Chris reported that Lynette had called their family phone and reported that she was okay. While that's reassuring, it doesn't answer why Lynette would just stop communicating with her family. But Chris continued to reassure Lynette's family that she was reaching out to him periodically. Chris also claimed that Lynette was still using her bank card. But despite all this proof that Lynette was okay, her family was not convinced that she wasn't in trouble. Lynette didn't know how to drive, and to add to the oddity of the situation, she didn't appear to have taken any of her personal belongings with her. So how was she living on her own? Where was she? And what were the circumstances that actually led to her leaving? Meanwhile, as all this was going on, Chris permanently moved Joanna into the family home. In fact, he moved her in just two days after Lynette's disappearance. That does not seem like someone who's worried about their wife's safety, or someone who's particularly upset about her disappearance. But Lynette's family still maintained hope that she would return. However, that hope started to dwindle when three weeks later, Lynette's daughter started first grade. When Lynette did not show up for this momentous event, her family knew that something truly terrible must have happened to her. See, there was no way that Lynette would miss such an important milestone for her daughter. And these fears and questions haunted Lynette's family and friends for weeks while they tried to piece together what could have happened to her. That being said, Chris continued to reassure Lynette's family that she was checking in with him. But even that ended soon enough. And by the end of January, Chris told Lynette's family that she stopped checking in with him. But what about Chris? Was he really worried about his wife? Well, it would be almost six weeks before Chris would even report Lynette missing. Finally, on February 18th, Chris did go to the police. He claimed that Lynette had left their family due to their ongoing marital problems, but weren't Chris and Lynette going to therapy? And wasn't Lynette excited about the progress they were making? The facts just didn't add up, and Chris's next claim was the most preposterous yet. Chris suggested to the police that he thought Lynette might have joined a religious organization, implying that maybe she had joined a cult. Which makes little to no sense, especially considering that Lynette had never been religious at all, nor had she ever attended church. So how would someone with no religion suddenly join a cult? But that still didn't explain where she'd gone. Investigators tried to find any leads on the case, but they couldn't discover anything truly substantial. But Lynette's family was certain that she would never leave her children, and they believed that she might have been kidnapped or murdered. Despite these assumptions, though, the police couldn't find any evidence of anything happening to her. However, it would later come to light that during the first investigation, the police did not interview many of Lynette's relatives. During this time, Chris seemed to also join in the search for his wife. He even posted an article in a local newspaper asking Lynette to come home, and in that print-up, he included that he loved her and was eagerly awaiting her call. He also called all Lynette's friends to find any information about her whereabouts. Despite Chris's supposed eagerness to find Lynette, he later divorced her and just a year later married Joanna. That doesn't exactly sound like someone desperate to get his wife back, right? But in Lynette's absence, Joanna became the stepmother to Lynette's children. And Chris claimed that because he didn't want to traumatize his children about Lynette's disappearance, he told them Joanna was their real mother. I mean, that's an insane twist and not a good one. Needless to say, Lynette's relatives were extremely upset by this narrative and everything seemed a little too convenient for Chris. But despite all evidence to support that Chris might have had something to do with Lynette's disappearance, the police abandoned their investigation. They concluded that Lynette was in fact not in danger. The police said that Lynette had the right to her own fate, and the case was closed almost immediately without a proper investigation. But that was just the beginning of her family's fight to find out what happened to her. They would have to continue the investigation on their own for years. Meanwhile, Chris and Joanna moved with Lynette's kids to Queensland, and Chris almost completely cut ties with Lynette's family and friends. He would only occasionally call Lynette's mother. And just a few years later, Chris and Joanna had a daughter together. But what about Lynette? Where had she gone? Well, it would be another six long years without any answers. But in the late 1990s, something truly unexpected happened. Chris and Joanna got divorced, and with their split, some new truths came to light. Not long after their divorce, Joanna reached out to Lynette's family with some new information about her disappearance. So what did Joanna tell Lynette's family? Well, she told them that she had suspected that Chris had in fact murdered her. Well, that's quite an accusation, and if it's true, that means that Joanna had held onto those suspicions for years without saying anything, which is truly disturbing to me. So what would make Joanna suspect Chris of murder? According to Joanna, a month before Lynette vanished, Chris talked to her about hiring a hitman to get rid of her. What? I mean, isn't that what the police call a motive? Joanna went on to tell Lynette's family that Chris had also told her on the very same day that Lynette disappeared that Lynette had left forever and would never return. But Joanna's confessions don't stop there. She went on to tell the police that they needed to search Chris's old backyard. I mean, this is quite a turn of events and a lot to process. So what did the police do with all this new information? Did they finally arrest Chris? Dig up the backyard? Well, no, not exactly. In 1991, all the police did was question Chris about Lynette's disappearance. Seriously? That's it? 
hold on to your hats because this case gets even more frustrating. Chris told police that Joanna was lying and that she was only trying to drag his name in the mud because of their recent divorce. He went on to reassure police that he had nothing to do with Lynette's disappearance. Chris said that Joanna was motivated to lie because she was trying to get custody of their daughter. He further claimed that if he was arrested, it would benefit Joanna. And with no leads to Lynette's whereabouts, police were not convinced Joanna was telling the truth. But the police did seize Chris's and his brother Paul's phones to see if there was any suspicious behavior. But they didn't find anything suspicious, so investigators once again abandoned Lynette's case. Such a frustrating turn of events for Lynette's family who still didn't have any answers as to where she'd gone. So what about Joanna's confession? Was she telling the truth or was her motive only to get custody of her daughter? Those answers and more would have to wait several more years before they were finally answered. And that meant that Lynette's family would have to wait another nine years until the year 2000 to get any more answers. That's when police finally decided to excavate the backyard of Chris's old home. So what took them so long? Well, your guess is as good as mine. But while police were finally motivated to dig up the backyard, they didn't have funding to do the whole yard. So the police decided to start digging in an area that Chris had told the new owners of his house to not alter. So perhaps the police had suspected Chris all along? So what did the police find when they dug into the yard all these years later? Well, the simple answer is not much. The only thing the police managed to find was a torn pink cardigan. The cardigan had what looked like a stab wound in it, and investigators admitted that it could have belonged to Lynette. But the DNA analysis found no matches with Lynette, which again, did not give the police a lot to go on. I mean, I was really hoping that they would have found some substantial piece of evidence. It must have been agonizing for Lynette's family to have this case closed and reopened so many times. But again, the police were left with no leads and no way to move forward on the case. But another year later, the case would once again gain some traction when the deputy state prosecutor concluded that Lynette was in fact murdered after using all the various tidbits of evidence from Lynette's abusive relationship to Joanna's confessions. The state prosecutor also said that Lynette was probably murdered by someone close to her. So, with this new revelation in the case, the police once again resumed their investigation. And this time they did question all her friends and relatives. But once again, they failed to find any leads. How is that possible? It just seems more than a little crazy that so much time could go by without any lead. And it would be another two years before investigators would have a suspect. So who was this suspect that police finally found? Well, I think you can guess who they might have begun to suspect, right? Chris was finally moved up to being a suspect. but. What had taken the police so long to come to this conclusion? Well, apparently the police had been waiting to accumulate enough evidence to charge Chris with murder. But due to the lack of evidence in this haunting case, Chris could still not be convicted of murder. A truly agonizing chain of events for Lynette's family and friends. Years and years with no answers and false hope must have been so painstakingly hard. So was that the end of this tragic case? Would Lynette's disappearance remain a mystery forever? In 2006, hope for Lynette's case came back when Chris claimed he saw his late wife among the extras in a film on TV. But despite looking into Chris's claim, no evidence was found to support his story. Desperate to resolve this case, in 2010, police announced a $100,000 reward for information about Lynette's disappearance. While this is a good development in this case, it feels a little too late since so much of the evidence that could have been helpful to find Lynette earlier might might have been long gone by this point. Still nothing came of this announcement and reward, and four years later, the police doubled the amount of money. But despite the large sum of money, investigators failed to find any reliable leads. What do we mean by reliable leads? Well, in a case where money is promised, there are always people who want to earn some extra money, and those people are willing to make up any information just to get the money. But despite the lack of leads and evidence, in 2015, the police decided to try something else. So they decided to dig up another section of Chris's yard. That sounds promising. So did investigators investigators find any trace of Lynette's remains or any clues as to her whereabouts? Unfortunately, this search was also unsuccessful. I mean, you gotta give the investigators credit for continuing to search despite not having any leads or any hard evidence. So, did this tragic case run cold? Fortunately, it did not. The turning point in this case happened in 2018 when a podcast was released about Lynette's disappearance. The podcast and this particular story were about to gain massive popularity in Australia. And on the show, several arguments were presented that depicted how Chris could be responsible for Lynette's murder. Just hearing about the twists and turns in this case, it would make sense that many thought Chris was guilty. And in fact, several million people who listened to the podcast came to that same conclusion. Chris was guilty. But the court of popular opinion is not the court. But because of the public outrage about the case, Lynette's investigation finally got the attention that it deserved so many years earlier. And the public demanded that justice be found for Lynette and her family. Inspired by the public cry for justice, the podcast author spoke to Lynette's relatives and tried to find new leads. So was he successful in finding anything helpful in the case? Once again, he was not. 
but don't lose hope. All this public upset wasn't for nothing. It turns out that the public outcry was enough to initiate a new investigation into Lynette's case. And on December 5th, 2018, detectives arrested Chris on the charge of murder. So did Chris finally confess? He didn't. Chris continued to plead his innocence and was even released on bail before the start of the trial. But even if Chris was not guilty of murder, he had been assumed guilty of grooming minors like Joanna and a few more of his high school students, as well as sleeping with minors and several accounts of domestic violence. While he was never charged with any of these crimes, there were many who witnessed and or believed him to be guilty. So could Chris be capable of murder after a lifetime of indiscretions and illicit behavior? Well, that's what this trial sought to find out. Unfortunately, the trial dragged on for several more years, all while Chris insisted upon his innocence. But in June 2019, Chris finally appeared before a judge and pleaded not guilty to Lynette's murder. He insisted that the trial should only start in 2020 due to the strong and negative public opinion about him. Chris was also facing a charge of carnal knowledge with a girl between the ages of 10 and 17. This was in relation to his relationship with Joanna while still a teacher at Cromer High School. Despite all the charges against Chris, his lawyers consistently managed to delay the process, and the trial consistently kept getting delayed. They said that because of the widespread coverage of the case, the jury would hold a biased attitude towards him. And Chris even applied to have the case delayed on the basis that there had been an inordinate delay in prosecuting him, and therefore there was a risk that members of the jury could have prejudged his guilt. This was due to widespread publicity about the case from the popular podcast. And for this reason, the case was delayed in order to allow publicity to fade from jurors' minds. However, Chris's application for a permanent stay was denied in both the NSW Supreme Court and the Court of Criminal Appeal. And that could have been the end of this case, but luckily it wasn't. And in April 2022, Chris was denied special leave by Justice Stephen Gagler to appeal to the High Court of Australia. And in May 2022, Justice Robert Beach Jones granted Chris's application for a trial without a jury. So it took decades to even get a trial for Lynette's death. The trial finally began on May 9th, 2022 before Justice Ian Harrison. It ran for over 10 weeks, and during that time, Chris's lawyers insisted that there was not a single piece of evidence against him, and that the charges against him were simply based on societal biases based on the popular podcast. And his defense insisted that many believed the podcaster's opinion that Chris was guilty, but had not adequately evaluated the situation. I think we've evaluated a lot of the situation, and the only explanation that seems to make sense is that Chris murdered Lynette. What do you think? Do you think Chris is guilty, or do you believe in his innocence? Well, it's not on us to judge, but let's take a listen to the prosecution side. The prosecution argued that despite not having any evidence per se, they had built their case on a lot of indirect factors and presented a laundry list of circumstantial evidence. So this case would be what they called a circumstantial case. And for anyone unaware, circumstantial evidence allows for more than one explanation to be given in court. In other words, different pieces of circumstantial evidence may be required so that each corroborates the conclusions drawn from the others. I know it's a little confusing, but essentially, circumstantial evidence can be brought together to strongly support a particular inference over another. And this tactic of using circumstantial evidence is implied alternative explanations have been ruled out. So in the case of Lynette's murder, because there's no direct evidence like a body or a murder weapon, circumstantial evidence was used instead. See, in criminal law, the circumstantial evidence can be used to support the truth of an assertion of guilt or absence of guilt. Unfortunately, the defense can sometimes declare reasonable doubt in cases that rely on circumstantial evidence like Lynette's case. Therefore, circumstantial evidence may not be enough to convict someone fairly if the defense can argue that there is a reasonable doubt. I know it's a lot of legal jargon, but it does help to explain the next part of this case. Reasonable doubt can be explained as the highest standard of proof used in court. And to find someone guilty, the jury, and in this case the judge, must be sure of their guilt beyond any reasonable doubt. But even when circumstantial evidence is not enough to convict or acquit someone, it can contribute to other decisions being made about the case. That being said, there are certain types of evidence like testimony that can be considered both direct evidence or it can be considered circumstantial. And this is important in Lynette's case because a lot of the evidence did come from testimonials. And like in the case with Lynette, circumstantial evidence is especially important when there's little or no direct evidence. So when we talk about the prosecution using circumstantial evidence in this case, now you know a little more about what that means, and I think you can see how convincing circumstantial evidence can be in a given case. So what kinds of circumstantial evidence did the prosecution present to support the case that Chris did in fact murder Lynette? The first thing that the prosecution presented to the judge was the multitude of family members and friends who had seen bruises and injuries on Lynette's body during her marriage to Chris. The prosecution sought to prove that Chris had a history of violence. Therefore, if Chris did escalate to murder, that's not beyond the scope of other domestic violence cases. Lynette's relatives also testified in court to not only seeing the bruises and injuries, but that Lynette also admitted to such abuses from Chris. The 
prosecution also argued that Chris's motive for murder was his desire for an unfettered relationship with Joanna, which seems like a pretty reasonable assertion. The defense did acknowledge that Chris had failed his wife, but they still claimed that she was the one that left and abandoned her family. The defense went on to say that Lynette might have even created a whole new life. Again, none of this would make sense with Lynette's previous behavior, but the defense also called forward a number of witnesses who claimed to have seen Lynette since her disappearance, but Chris himself chose not to give any evidence to this regard. On August 30th, 2022, Justice Harrison took five hours to deliberate, after which he told the court that he found Chris guilty of murdering Lynette, a huge break for Lynette's family. The judge said in court that he had discovered that Chris had lied on multiple occasions, including lying about his relationship with Joanna. He had also deceived Lynette when he told her he wanted to resume a relationship with her, and he had lied to police about receiving phone calls from Lynette after she disappeared. The judge went on to reject all the alleged sightings of Lynette as wholly unreliable, and instead he found there was a most compelling body of evidence that made the hypothesis that Lynette would abandon her family not believable, which would go in line with all that Lynette's family had told the authorities already. All in all, the judge said that he was satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that Lynette had died as a result of a conscious and voluntary act by Chris Dawson. Thank goodness justice was finally served for Lynette. And on December 2nd, 2022, Chris was sentenced to 24 years in jail with a non-parole period of 18 years for the murder of Lynette. While this case took decades to resolve, at least Lynette's family received some small form of justice. But this case is a reminder that domestic violence can happen to anyone regardless of their social status or economic background. Domestic violence is an issue that does not discriminate. It affects all people regardless of race, gender identity, sexual orientation, and socioeconomic standing. If you are in an abusive relationship, there is help available. To contact the National Domestic Abuse Hotline, call 1-800-799-7233. That's all I have for you today. I'm Lucy, and thanks for watching Killer Bites. What happened to Michelle Von Emster, and how did her body end up in the ocean right off the coast of San Diego? I'm Mac, and this is Killer Bites. Today, we will be talking about the unsolved death of 25-year-old cancer survivor Michelle Von Emster. Let's get started. On April 15th, 1994, on the sunset cliff of San Diego, California, there were two surfers out in the waves where they noticed some seagulls perched on the top of a floating pile of kelp. They went towards the seagulls and discovered the lifeless body of Michelle Von Emster. Now let's back up. Who was Michelle Von Emster? Michelle Von Emster was from San Carlos, California, a city near San Francisco. She was part of a big family of five sisters. She graduated from Notre Dame High School in 1986. She went on to study at St. Mary's College, but she later paused from pursuing her education at St. Mary's after being diagnosed with leukemia. She went on to have cancer treatments and a year later she was a survivor, hell yeah. But after completing her cancer treatment, she decided she wanted to celebrate by traveling. She moved to Loma Portal in San Diego, California, right near the ocean. Michelle was a free spirit and a bit of a drifter. She liked to spend most of her time at the beach. She enjoyed swimming, surfing, and gazing out at the breathtaking views. San Diego was the perfect place for her to settle down. She moved around quite a bit within San Diego, bouncing around from apartment to apartment but eventually she settled down in a shared two bedroom house at 4999 Mir Avenue in Ocean Beach. This neighborhood was known for its heavy drug use, violence, mayhem, and cheap rent. This area was thought as bohemian and vibrant, but it had a crime rate that exceeded the national average. This neighborhood was nicknamed the War Zone. So you can imagine it was a pretty bad neighborhood, but it was close to the beach, which Michelle was very happy about. So what actually happened to Michelle Von Emster? Well, there are a few theories out there of what actually went down, but I'll let you decide what you think really happened. When Michelle's body was found, she was naked, but she still had a few pieces of jewelry on. She still had a bracelet and two rings. Michelle's body was in bad shape. There were multiple scrapes and bruises. The butterfly tattoo on her shoulder was half gone due to the skin being torn off. Also, her leg was missing from the thigh down. It was a truly awful scene. Michelle's purse was later found not in the water with her, but 2.5 miles away from on the beach. Inside the purse were her keys, her driver's license, her makeup, pay stub, and a fanny pack with $27 in cash. And while Michelle's purse was recovered, unfortunately her clothes were never recovered. She was last seen on the night of April 14th at 8 p.m. Michelle and her roommate Coco Campbell were headed to a Pink Floyd concert, but it turned out that they bought the wrong tickets. So they headed back home. Michelle asked her roommate to drop her off at the San Diego Pier 
by their house. She was last seen wearing a green trench coat and purse. After her body was discovered the following day on April 15th, it was taken to the lifeguard headquarters at 4 p.m. Because of the condition of her body and numerous injuries, the investigators assumed that she was killed by a shark attack. They assumed it was probably a great white shark. This theory allegedly was backed up by the investigator on this case, Brian Blackburn, a medical examiner, marine biologist, and harbor police. An autopsy revealed that Michelle had a broken neck and broken ribs, along with scrapes and bruises along her whole body. She also had sand in her mouth, throat, lungs, and stomach. These injuries seem to line up with the shark theory. Supposedly a shark would have come up, bite her leg, and then drag her to the bottom of the ocean. And at some point her neck gets broken, her mouth fills up with sand, which she chokes and swallows, she could die from blood loss and from drowning. But the theory isn't perfect. There's this guy, Ralph Collier, who is a leading expert of Pacific Ocean great white shark behavior and ecology. He came and examined Michelle's body and made the comment, when a great white shark breaks off a part of a limb, the break is clean, almost like you put it on a table saw. What remained of Michelle's femur was anything but. It looked like what happens when you get a piece of bamboo and whittle it down to a point with a knife. I've looked at close to 100 photos of cases over the years and I've never seen any bones that come to a point. Ralph Collier also said that it was weird that Michelle would have sand in her stomach, especially after having her leg bitten off. He said the damage would have severed her femoral artery and she would have bled to death quickly. But for her to have sand in her stomach, she had to take a big gulping breath as she made contact with the sand. There are too many things in this case that are not consistent with the great white shark behavior. Also, another investigator on the case, Richard Rosenblatt, said that if a great white shark had bitten Michelle's body, they would likely have found a great white shark tooth in her body. But the investigators did not find a shark tooth located anywhere. Richard Rosenblatt also said it could only have been a great white shark and no other type of shark, but apparently a shark probably didn't attack her. The next theory of what supposedly happened to Michelle von Emster was that she fell off the cliffs that surrounded this part of the beach in San Diego. This particular spot, the Sunset Cliffs, is known to be a little dangerous. There have been past reports of rocks crumbling and a couple of people actually have died from falling from this area before. This theory was checked out by a San Francisco medical examiner. Yes, the scrapes, bruises, broken neck, and broken ribs would seem to line up with the falling from the cliffs down into the water. However, it was ruled out because the leg injury didn't seem to add up in this equation. A fall from a cliff could not have given that kind of leg injury. The next theory is that Michelle von Emster allegedly drowned, which led to her death. Maybe she took her clothes off to go skinny dipping at midnight and just so happened to get caught up in the current, knocked up against some rocks and then died. And then later a group of sharks came by and bit her leg off? I mean, I don't know. Well, it turns out that the temperature of the water at that time was too cold to actually go swimming without a wetsuit. It was like 59 degrees during the day and 57 at night. So I don't think she's just decided to go swimming alone at night, no clothes on or a wetsuit in freezing water. That just doesn't make sense to me. The next theory about what supposedly happened to Michelle von Emster was that she was murdered. There are theories that a bartender named Edwin Decker might have been the one to end Michelle's life. He said that he first met Michelle at Rumors, the coffee shop she worked in 1984. The coffee shop where Michelle worked was owned by Bill Winston. Bill Winston also happened to own Winston's the bar that Decker worked at. Decker said that the coffee shop and Winston's were connected and he would often go in there to grab coffee and that's where he met her and he was drawn to her immediately. Now at first they started off as friends, but there's some level of interest on both of their parts. Decker and Michelle had drinks on April 13th, 1994. They'd been flirting with each other for a few weeks. Decker eventually convinced her to go out on a date with him on April 13th. After the date, they went and bought some beer and cigarettes to take back to Decker's apartment and just hang out. Michelle left his apartment the next morning at 5 a.m. on April 14th, and on the very same day, Michelle passed away. Decker made the comment about Michelle and their relationship that there was a total intellectual connection. I felt there was an emotional connection too, at least on my part there was, and we also had a physical connection. And I was so bummed when a couple of days went by and she hadn't called. I was about to give up on the idea but Michelle wasn't blowing him off. She had passed away. Decker wrote a poem after hearing the news of her passing, which said, the reports said there was a tattoo, a butterfly on her shoulder, which I remembered that night on my couch when I, like the shark, 
chewed on her lips and took off her shirt. I don't think Edwin is the one who ended Michelle's life though, but back in 2008, while Michelle's case was still unsolved, Decker teamed up with investigators and wrote to the San Diego medical examiner asking them to reevaluate Michelle's case. If you were guilty, you definitely wouldn't want to draw more attention to the case or have things looked at again. You would want the case to disappear and remain unsolved. So that doesn't make any sense that Edwin Decker would be the bad guy. Plus, it sounded like he really liked her and cared for Michelle. There is another person that is thought to be the one to end Michelle's life, an unknown stalker. It is said that Michelle had a stalker while she was working at Rumors Coffee Shop. She decided to get a different job so she couldn't be stalked at the coffee shop anymore. She landed a gig at the Cabrillo Stationery and Office Supply Shop to throw off her stalker. She wouldn't be at the coffee shop anymore. She would be at a new location and hopefully her stalker wouldn't be able to find her anymore. Michelle didn't know the name of the person stalking her, but she did know that he drove a motorcycle. Michelle's former boss, Denise Knox from the stationery store, recalls that the very next day after Michelle's death, a man came into the store and wanted to print out a bunch of copies of Michelle's autopsy. She was quoted in the San Diego Reader saying that the weird guy who wanted all those copies of her autopsy, he rode a motorcycle too. So maybe this unknown stalker that we know very little about could be the one behind the death of Michelle von Emster. Or this could have been a random act of violence from someone who we are not even suspecting. As I said earlier, she was living in a sketchy neighborhood. Someone over there could have easily done away with her and then tossed the body into the water. There's just too many unknowns in this story to draw a firm conclusion. Although I will say that I think that Michelle's death was no accident. I think that someone did this to her. There are other theories out there too, such as a car accident cover up, a motorboat accident, suicide, but again, nothing has been proven true. The case is still left unsolved to this day. We ask that if you have any information regarding Michelle Von Emster's death, please contact the appropriate authorities as soon as possible. What happened to Michelle is awful, but it would be great to be able to solve this case and bring some peace to Michelle's friends and family. And that's it guys, I'm Mac. Thank you so much for watching Killer Bites and we'll see you next time. What's up Killer Bites fam? I hope you're ready for some true crime. If this is your first time here, Welcome to Killer Bites, a web series where we dish on all sorts of mind-blowing true crime cases. Now in today's episode, I'll be going over everything we know about the disappearance of Fawn Maria Mountain. When Fawn disappeared in 2012 without a trace, her girlfriend Heather didn't go looking for her. Instead, she immediately remodeled their trailer home, moved out of state, and started dating another woman. So it seems like the girlfriend is clearly responsible, right? Well. Fawn filed a restraining order against her mom shortly before disappearing, which makes things more confusing. Maybe it was just the mom. Stick around to find out. 25-year-old Fawn Maria Mountain was last seen in November of 2012. At the time, she was in a relationship with a woman named Heather. Together, they lived in a trailer in Claysburg, Pennsylvania. Heather's brother, Mike, lived in the same trailer park with his girlfriend, Stephanie. So they were pretty close relationship-wise and distance-wise. On November 25th, both couples went over to Heather and Mike's parents' house. There, they helped Heather's parents clean up their butcher shop and prepare for the upcoming hunting season. When they finished their chores, Fawn, Heather, Mike, and Stephanie had a few drinks before heading back to their trailer park together. They stopped at Mike's trailer first so Heather could help Mike unload something from his car and bring it inside. While that was going on, Fawn and Stephanie stayed in the car and made small talk. That's when Fawn told Stephanie she planned to go home watch a scary movie and chill out before going to bed. Right after that, Heather and Mike came back, the two couples parted ways, and they went about their evenings. The following morning, Heather's parents came by to pick her and Mike up as they both worked at the butcher shop. When the parents pulled up to Heather's trailer, they noticed Heather outside smoking with no fawn in sight. Stephanie asked Heather where fawn was, and she said she had run away in the middle of the night. Uh, and you're just out there just casually smoking a cigarette like that? I'd be panicking. Heather claimed she got up to go to the bathroom around 3 a.m. and Fawn wasn't there. She said she tried looking for Fawn but had no luck. This wasn't the first time that Fawn had run away, however, but we'll get to that in a little bit later. So Heather went about her day as the suspicions grew, specifically Stephanie's suspicions. Heather normally freaked out about Fawn running away, but she didn't this time. Fawn didn't take anything from their trailer before allegedly running away. She didn't grab a jacket, and it was in November in Pennsylvania. Heather didn't reach out to any of Fawn's family or friends to let them know she ran away or ask them if she knew about her whereabouts. And over the next few weeks, she had made some drastic life decisions. Things like remodeling her and Fawn's trailer home, moving to Ohio and dating a new woman. All this stuff happened 
way too fast according to popular opinion. Stephanie was the one who eventually called Vaughn's mom, Dorothy, because she had a feeling something had happened based on all of these weird factors. Dorothy tried to report her daughter as missing, but the police, of course, took Heather's word as the Bible and just assumed that Fawn ran away and was totally okay. So let's travel back in time to learn more about Fawn's life until this point and see if there are any clues that might lead to more information about her disappearance. Fawn grew up in a very broken home. Her parents were always fighting and she was physically violated at a young age by several people in her life. Despite all of this, Fawn tried to remain positive. Outgoing, adventurous, cheerful, friendly, and kind were the words most people used to describe Fawn. But Fawn struggled in relationships. Since Fawn was abused by men growing up, it was all she knew. She also had serious trust issues for understandable reasons. When she started dating, the guys she often went out with were scumbags who treated her like shit. One of the abusive guys Fawn was with got her pregnant twice. She gave birth to both babies, but lost custody of them because she struggled with getting a job and functioning as an adult who needed to be responsible for two babies. Her baby daddy really messed her up, both physically and mentally. Fawn lost all self-worth and it was at her lowest of lows. So she fell back into this awful cycle of dating terrible men. Fawn got pregnant for a third time with a baby girl named Caden. Unfortunately, Caden was stillborn, which crushed Fawn leaving her more broken and more traumatized than before. So here's where we get to Fawn and Heather. They met in 2009 at a local bar. Now up until that point, Fawn had only dated men, but after meeting Heather, she decided to give women a try romantically. She spent every waking minute with Heather and moved in with her pretty quickly. When Fawn told her mom she wanted to move in with Heather, she told her she'd never move back to their hometown of Altoona. Dorothy thought this was an odd thing to say, especially since Altoona was just a 20 mile drive from where she was moving with Heather. Friends and family mentioned Fawn acting strange after moving with Heather, and Heather changed a lot in regards to the way that she treated Fawn. Over time, Heather became very possessive of Fawn. Heather took Fawn everywhere she went, even if it meant leaving her locked in the car while she was at work. Fawn wasn't allowed to hang out with friends, get a job, or have a cell phone. But Heather manipulated Fawn into thinking all of this was for her safety and well-being, which Fawn convinced herself into believing. She loved Heather and trusted that she truly had her best interests at heart. And then the physical abuse started. Fawn went to the hospital several times for injuries, which definitely raised eyebrows. But as soon as social workers and nurses started asking questions about Fawn potentially being harmed at home, Heather would switch up the hospital they went to when Fawn was hurt. There became a point when Fawn started to realize how horrible Heather was to her. Fawn tried to run away several times, but Heather would always find her and force her home. In 2011, Fawn filed a restraining order against her mom, Dorothy, just out of nowhere. Dorothy was in shock. She didn't have the greatest relationship with her daughter in the beginning, but they'd recently been doing well. So why would Fawn file for a restraining order all of a sudden? But it wasn't Fawn who filed for the order, it was Heather. Oh my God, this girl is insane. Speaking of restraining orders and Heather being insane, Stephanie said a few of Heather's past partners got restraining orders against her because she was so abusive. So the court decided Heather was clearly a danger to these people, which meant she could definitely be and was a danger to Fawn. Heather continued to seclude Fawn from the outside world and Dorothy was really the only other person in Fawn's life aside from Heather. So with the new order in place, there was really nothing going for Fawn. She wasn't able to see her mom, didn't have friends, a job, or any activities that brought her joy other than her conversations with Stephanie through the window. But it wasn't long until Heather caught wind of Fawn and Stephanie's window chats and boarded up the windows. Isn't that crazy? Like, after this, Fawn tried to run away several more times. Each time, Heather found her and forced her back home. In November 2012, Fawn ran away to her mom's house. Heather quickly found her and called the police on Dorothy for breaking the restraining order. Dorothy was sent to jail for two days because of this. Wow. At this point, Dorothy was extremely concerned for her daughter's well-being, but she really couldn't do anything because of this restraining order. So she asked the police to do welfare checks on Fawn every once in a while. They performed these until November, the month she vanished. Fawn wasn't officially reported missing until 2015. That's three years later. Fawn's relatives kept trying to contact her and they tried to see her in person, but it was clear she wasn't there. They had no idea she had been missing for three years. 
Fawn's family did some sleuthing and learned Fawn was still receiving welfare checks to Heather's trailer. They decided to call the Social Security office to make a report. The Social Security office sent out a letter to Fawn about a mandatory appointment that she failed to appear at. And that's what it took for the police to finally take Fawn's disappearance seriously. Well, actually, they didn't even take it seriously. They just filed a missing persons report. And after that, they didn't follow up with anyone, conduct any searches, or really put any effort into looking for Fawn. So Fawn and her cousin Bridget fell out of touch as they grew up and Bridget didn't find out about the disappearance until 2017. Bridget knew she had to do something to help find her cousin. She reached out to Stephanie to get more information and started bugging the police about the case. Bridget and Stephanie became driving forces in this case, helping spread the word and trying to piece everything together. The woman reached out to people in Fawn's life to ask some questions. Everyone said they couldn't remember specifics but said something along the lines of, I did a thorough interview with the police a few years ago. They should know. So Bridget and Stephanie reached out to the police to see if they could get their interviews. But the police said they lost the recordings. The person in charge of the case was fired because of this, but no one had been assigned to Fawn's case after that. Seems hella lazy and completely disrespectful to Fawn's situation. In August, Bridget finally got the state involved with a new investigation of the case. It seemed like the authorities finally had their act together and were ready to get down to the bottom of this case five years too late. A reward was posted. Heather was evicted from the trailer park for violence, sh shocker, and the grounds of the trailer park were searched. Bridget and company started a Facebook group to spread the word. Now to this day, we don't know if she's alive, but most people assume she is not. Although Dorothy seems a little sketchy with the straining order thing, we now know that Heather was the one who filed. And I know it's suspicious that she didn't contact the rest of her family about Fawn vanishing. But several reports and videos say Dorothy has a cognitive deficit that kind of explains this. As for Heather, she's looking more and more suspicious by the minute. I briefly mentioned this earlier, but Heather remodeled their trailer home shortly after Fawn went missing, redoing the floors and everything. This leads me to believe that she was covering up evidence. Heather then moved to Ohio, started dating a girl, and then moved back with her to Pennsylvania where they later got married. Possibly the most suspicious element of all is that Heather's family sold their butcher shop a few months after Fawn's disappearance. All of their equipment and tools were sold as well and a lot of people suspect Fawn may have been murdered and mutilated with these tools and equipment. That would make sense as to why Fawn's body has yet to be discovered. Heather also lied several times about where Fawn was. She first claimed that she ran away, then said she was in prison in Arizona, and later told someone else that she was in prison in Ohio. I mean, nothing adds up here, and it's really frustrating that no major advancements have been made in a case that is now 10 years old. My hope is that with the new traction on social media, we can finally get down to the bottom of this and get answers and justice for Fawn's sake. Now, I will pass this to you. I mean, do you think that Fawn is still out there? I mean, if not, who do you think is responsible for her passing, and what do you think happened? Please be kind in the comments as this is a real person with mourning friends and family who may see what you write. So if you can, consider donating to their GoFundMe or simply share this video to inform more people. Guys, thank you so much for watching another episode of Killer Bites. I'm Mac and we'll see you next time. This story has twists and turns and to top it all off, it's a locked room mystery. So when Greg Flanagan returned to his hotel room one night, he began his favorite nightly routine that he always did when he was alone on business trips. He flopped on the bed, lit a cigarette, ate some Reese's candy, and turned on the movie Iron Man 2. But what Greg didn't know when he checked in was that he would never check out. One morning, Susie Flanagan called her husband Greg to ask how his business trip was going, but he didn't pick up. Now, this was Susie and Greg's usual tradition, to talk on the phone each morning when Greg was away on a business trip. So when Greg wasn't picking up around the time he was normally awake, Susie got nervous. Greg also didn't show up for work that day, so two of his coworkers went over to his hotel room to check on him. After they finally got the door open, they were met with something pretty dang shocking. Detective Apple got to the scene and checked things out, but he didn't notice anything out of the ordinary about the body. Investigators snapped a few pictures of the scene and then sent Greg off for an autopsy so they could figure out what the exact medical cause of his early checkout was. The only mark on the man's body that the examiner could see was a scrape on his cheek, which the examiner figured must have happened when Greg's face hit the rug. But then the examiner noticed a rather interesting injury. So the examiner began the autopsy and noticed that he was not looking at someone who expired from natural causes. At the front of Greg's torso, he saw an extensive amount of internal damage that didn't make sense at all. 
The coroner mentioned that he would usually see this kind of damage from a car accident or a person who's been beaten, so he begins to poke around more. And that's when he found two broken ribs and a hole in Greg's heart. At that point, the examiner believed that someone had attacked Greg and delivered a crushing blow to his chest that caused lethal damage. He also determined that the injury to Greg's groin was from someone kicking it hard. What started off as a simple call for Detective Apple was about to turn into one of the most confusing and mysterious cases of his entire career. After six months of chasing down every lead possible, Apple was stuck. At first, he assumed that Greg could have been beaten outside the room and then dropped back inside, but he kept getting hung up on Greg's injuries. The confusing thing is, the outside of Greg's body didn't show any signs of being battered, which is weird considering how much of his insides had been scrambled. Also, if the attack had occurred inside the room, there certainly weren't any signs of struggle, and no one nearby claimed to have heard anything. Weeks go by, and then months, and Apple was looking into every theory he could think of. He considered Susie hiring a hitman, or Greg's brother Michael, who was also his business partner, but of course, nothing pointed to either of them, and by the end of 2010, Apple was absolutely stuck. But just when it seemed that Greg's case was about to turn cold, Susie decided to reach out to a private investigator who specializes in these types of mysterious cases. Enter Ken Brennan. Ken is a former Long Island cop and DEA special agent, and he only took on cases that he definitely thought he could solve. The next morning, Apple picked up his new BFF, Ken, and they paid a visit to the hotel room. Apple showed Ken the crime scene photos, went over the evidence, and laid out the last seven months of his life that he had devoted to investigating the case. When Apple was finished, Ken said, I think I know how, who, and when it happened. And I think I know how we're gonna catch him. Ken called Susie and asked if her husband was right or left-handed, and she told him right. Then he asked if Greg ever smoked with a cigarette in his left hand, and she said, nope, only his right hand. Ken thanked Susie, then hung up the phone, ready with his theory. With the circuit blowing out at around 8.30 p.m., he believed that this was also around the time Greg expired because the AC was shut off. He said that within a few minutes, the room would have grown hot enough for Greg to have realized it had shut off and turned it back on. He thought Greg was already lifeless before he even had time to realize the AC was still off. With the burnt cigarette in Greg's left hand, he didn't think that Greg had been attacked somewhere else and then placed back in the room. He said it was just too specific for an attacker to place him back in the room and then put a lit cigarette in Greg's hand. Ken thought that Greg lit the cigarette himself and got up from the bed when he suddenly keeled over. Ken said that it made the most sense for it to have been in Greg's right hand, but he was about to open the door, so he switched it to his left so he could grab the doorknob with his right. He knew that Greg wasn't attacked in the room, but he definitely expired in there, and pretty quickly at that. So how? Ken wasn't exactly sure how, but he knew for certain that Greg was just minding his own business when he just suddenly passed, which made him suspect the electricians next door. Apple told Ken he had already looked into them and said they were happy to help out so they didn't seem suspicious. But Ken pointed out that it had been seven months, and if the men were as fond of drinking and gabbing with their buddies as the hotel staff said they were, someone had to know something. All of the electricians they questioned were certainly aware of the story, even if they hadn't been at the hotel at the time. A lot were still curious about it and asked if they've managed to solve it yet. But as Ken was driving home with Apple that day, it suddenly hit him. So Ken was like, go back to the hotel. And Apple was like, what, why? And Ken was like, we're looking for a bullet. Oh snap, a bullet. It all makes sense. Wait, does it? They got back to the room and immediately started looking everywhere. They searched the floors, the furniture, the walls, everything. And just as the men were about to call it quits, Ken noticed an indentation on the wall of the room next door. It looked like the indent should have been right where the handle of a door would hit when it was opened. But when they opened it, it didn't match up. It also looked like the indent had been patched over. So when the duo went to the other room, the one where the electricians had been staying, there it was clear as day, a perfectly neat hole lined up with the smaller one on the other side, and it looked like someone tried to patch it up with toothpaste. When the two men went to the medical examiner, he refused to believe them. He insisted that Greg was beaten and that he didn't find a bullet anywhere. And besides, he couldn't exhume the body because Greg was already in an urn. The two detectives looked over the autopsy photos and every injury that pointed out to the examiner that could have been a bullet, he would reply with, yeah, it could also look like that from a beating. But when Ken and Apple got through the photo of Greg's heart and it clearly had a hole in it, the examiner agreed that it was a bullet hole. And now it was time for the duo to find out from the electricians what really went down that night. After some pressure from the detectives, the men finally broke and told them everything. 
So next door to Greg's room in room 349, three electricians were boozing it up after a long day of work. The three electricians are Tim, Trent, and Lance. According to both Tim and Trent, Lance got super wasted and Lance asked Trent to go get another bottle from his car and also his 9mm Ruger. Trent did and the group said Lance started playing around with the firearm and jokingly pointed it at Tim. Tim immediately dropped to the ground and was like, dude, that but when he pointed it at the foot of the bed where Trent was, it accidentally went off. Immediately, Lance panicked, bundled up the weapon, and ran back down to his car to hide it. Tim, Trent, and Lance all agreed that day to stick to the same story, to play dumb and hope it never came back to them. With the truth finally off of Tim and Trent's chest, Tim agreed to call Lance while the detectives listened to see if he could get him to spill. Tim called up Lance and filled him in on everything, including the part about him spilling the tea to the detectives. After a long moment of silence, Lance was just like, about the Ruger going off? Because he didn't just tell someone about his mistake or even check to see if the person in the room was all right. Lance was trying to hide his connection to the case and that was going to make him look even worse when it came time for his trial. And that's why you always tell the truth. If he had said something or tried to get help, he might not have gotten any jail time at all. Lance was sentenced to 10 years in jail for accidentally firing around into Greg. When the verdict was read, Susie couldn't help but smile. She told Lance that he'd met his match because she would have spent the rest of her life trying to track down whoever it was that took her husband from her. John and Michaela McAreevy were brand spanking newlyweds who had jetted off to a tropical paradise on the eastern African island of Mauritius to celebrate their special day. After a beautiful wedding, they flew out on their honeymoon to start the rest of their life together in luxurious style. However, the celebrations and happiness would soon turn to tragedy as the beautiful bride was killed, less than two weeks after tying the knot on the happiest day of her life. At face value, the expensive trip to Mauritius appeared like the perfect place to relax and unwind in the lap of luxury following their special day. Although for John and Michaela, it would prove to be where all their worst nightmares became reality. Michaela was born on New Year's Eve of 1983 and was 27 years old at the time she married John. Her father was very well known back at home in Ireland as a historically successful Gaelic football coach, very much a daddy's girl. Gaelic football provided the backbone of a very close and special bond with her dad, and it was inevitable that the sport was a key component in their family and a big part of their family life. Despite this relationship with her father and Gaelic football, Michaela wasn't a typical tomboy. In fact, she was conventionally feminine and beautiful, so much so that she successfully won a number of beauty pageants when she was in her 20s. Coupled with the fact that her father was a big deal in the country, this meant that she became something of a micro-celebrity and occasionally appeared on TV and in interviews. Michaela had been open and honest in public that due to her allegiances with her dad and the importance of football in her life, that any potential love interest would, in all reality, have to share a passion for the Gaelic sport. So it was no real surprise that the man she agreed to marry was the captain of his club, a respected Gaelic football player, and an accomplished accountant. For all intents and purposes, the couple seemed like a match made in heaven. And so on December 30th of 2010, just a day before her 27th birthday, John and Michaela were married at a beautiful ceremony in a small church in Tyrone, Northern Ireland. Friends and family described how they were madly in love with each other and shared an unbreakable bond. So off they flew to the island of Mauritius. They arrived at the Legends Hotel full of excitement and love. They had chosen that particular hotel because it had proved to be something of a popular hotspot amongst the Irish. It was a five-star luxury resort overlooking the spectacular Indian Ocean and surrounded by rock pools, forests, beautiful beaches, and palm trees. It was everything a luxury honeymoon was supposed to be. On January 9th of 2011, Security footage shows Michaela and John booking themselves into a couple of relaxing spa treatments. They were freshly married, enjoying their time together, and were intent on living the life of luxury and indulgence that they'd dreamed of when they booked the honeymoon. However, little could they have known that this special time together at the start of the rest of their life would only last another 24 hours before an unspeakable and devastating tragedy would unfold. The following day, 
On Monday, January 10th of 2011, in the morning, John had a golf lesson that was awarded as a part of the hotel package, while Michaela hung out and waited for him by the pool. They then went to one of the on-site restaurants for lunch before settling down for some afternoon tea to unwind. The newlyweds had received a box of luxury chocolates as part of their welcome package upon checking in. Michaela decided to pop back to the room to pick up the chocolates so they could enjoy them with their tea. Despite saying that she'd be right back, Michaela took longer than John expected, and as the minutes ticked by, he started to become concerned about her whereabouts. Given how close they were to their room, there was no reason why it should have taken so long. After waiting for more than 30 minutes, John started to feel like something must be wrong, and so he paid the bill at the restaurant and made his way back to the hotel room. Arriving back at the room, he realized that he'd left his key card by the swimming pool. Assuming that Michaela must be in the room, he knocked on the door for her to let him in. However, it appeared as though there was nobody actually in there. Despite the room being seemingly empty, John did think he could hear the faint sound of running water coming from inside. He was given a new car and escorted back to his room by a member of the hotel staff. But when he arrived back at the room, it immediately felt as though something wasn't right. He entered the room, only to find the running water noise to be increased upon his arrival. What he faced next is the stuff of nightmares and the worst possible discovery he could possibly have been faced with. Michaela's lifeless body could be seen floating in the bathtub. It took officers over half an hour to arrive on the scene and an additional one hour to cordon off the crime scene. In that time period, a number of significant mistakes were made that should never have happened. Dozens of people walked in and out of the hotel room, which was effectively a crime scene. Hotel staff, doctors, and even random guests that were passing by all entered the room at various times, subsequently contaminating and interfering with vital evidence. The most significant evidence was Michaela herself, and she was inexplicably moved from where she was in the bath out into the hall. John was initially considered to be a suspect, but was ultimately deemed not to have been involved. Within 24 hours of the discovery of Michaela's body, three hotel staff members had been arrested. The three staff members that were under investigation, Avinash Tribuhan, Sandeep Munya, and Raj Tikoy. All three were cleaners at the resort and had been using key cards to gain unlawful access to guests' apartments. After months of investigations and piecing together the evidence, the police believed they had a pretty good idea of what had happened. The key card surveillance software used for the room key cards suggested that somebody had gained access to the room with a keycard used to enter via the front door. It's thought that whoever had broken into the property planned to steal whatever they could find in the room, and this was supported by a fingerprint on the door to where the room safe was kept. It is believed that when Michaela then entered the room a couple of minutes later, the thief was startled by her unexpected return and attempted to hide in the bathroom, hoping that she wouldn't come in. Unfortunately for Michaela, she had no idea what was waiting for her on the other side of the bathroom door, and as she innocently entered the bathroom, she was attacked from behind by the intruding thief who seemingly panicked at the whole situation. What started as a petty theft had taken a dramatic turn for the worse, and he then proceeded to strangle the beautiful 27-year-old. After he'd killed her, it's thought he then placed her in the bathtub and ran the water in an attempt to make it appear as though she had drowned. After this, the same keycard records show that the next entry into the room was when Mark returned from reception with the new card. A week after the heartbreaking murder, another two suspects were arrested. These were 26-year-old Dasan Narayanan and 39-year-old Sonarani Mangu. The case against Dasan was a complicated one that would ultimately be hard to validate. As a security guard in the hotel, it was his fingerprint that was found on the door of the safe inside the room. However, there was also witness evidence that proved Dasan was seen inside the room helping with the fall out of the horror that unfolded as people tried to figure out what had happened and what was going on. It stands to reason that hotel security would be in and around the scene afterward, and so the inevitable DNA evidence that was linked to him was no longer sufficient to pin him specifically to the crime. This, of course, ties into the problem with the failure to seal off the crime scene after Michaela was found. Sonarana Mangu was also a security guard who investigators initially thought was involved. It was believed that these two suspects, along with the original three that were arrested, were part of an organized theft ring at the hotel. They worked together to gain access to guests' rooms, steal any belongings, and then split the profits 
distance between the five of them. However, there was insufficient evidence for the investigators, and they subsequently had to drop any murder charges against Dasan and Sonorain. The cleaner Raj Tikoy was also cleared of the charges, but under one condition. He would have to testify against his cleaning colleagues, Avanash, and his supervisor, Sandeep. The investigation and prosecution ended up being a long, drawn-out affair. The two remaining suspects, Avanash and Sandeep, waited 16 months before the trial for the murder of Michaela Makarivi to begin. The primary investigating team came under significant criticism for its handling of the case. Although Avanash did originally confess to the murder of the freshly married Michaela, the confession only came after allegedly being beaten into confessing by officers for three long days. Forensic DNA evaluations concluded that no physical DNA traces of four of the five suspects were ever found on the body of Michaela or at the crime scene. The single exclusion, of course, was Dasan, whose fingerprint DNA was confirmed on the door of the safe in the apartment, but was later discounted as incriminating as he had been in the room supporting John in the immediate aftermath of the fatal incident. Without conclusive and definitive DNA, evidence, it was impossible to find anyone guilty of murder. A security camera clip that had somewhat conveniently been leaked to the press just a day before the trial showed John and Michaela arguing intensely at the hotel resort reception, planting the seed, of course, for a domestic dispute, and once again putting John back in the frame for what would occur. If the clip was confirmed as being footage of John and Michaela, then the entire case would have been up in smoke. However, the timing of the clip was 15 minutes after Michaela had already been tragically murdered, so there's no way it could have been them. It happened to be a cleverly placed piece of evidence put together by the defense team. It turned out that the clip in question was actually of two German guests stopping at the resort, so the judge threw the evidence out and asked it be discounted from the case. The defense angle continued to heavily lean into the theory that it was John who had murdered his own wife, but the reality of it was that this thread never made any sense right from the get-go. A number of witnesses, in addition to security camera footage had John's whereabouts accounted for at all times. You can only imagine how difficult it must have been to not only experience the horrific murder of your brand new wife on your honeymoon, but then to be callously accused of being the one to kill her yourself. Not just privately, but in the media, in public, and in the courtroom. That has to be tough to take. But it wasn't just John who was targeted by the defense team. Even Michaela was scrutinized herself, with the defense suggesting that maybe the killing came as a result of a sexual fantasy with a stranger that went wrong. This of a murdered woman on her honeymoon. As agreed previously in order to gain full immunity, Raj Tikoy took to the stand as instructed. In his statement, he said that he had seen the cleaning trolley of Avanash outside the apartment and heard screams of pain coming from Michaela's room. He then witnessed Avanash and Sandeep come out of the room shortly after looking rather concerned and nervous. After confronting them, they threatened to kill him if he ever said anything to anyone. There was a lot riding on the case for the entire island of Mauritius, which so heavily relies on its tourism trade. Obviously, having a killer on the loose around its hotel resorts is hardly going to be great for business, so the defense went strongly on the suggestion of the heavily flawed investigation and the historically corrupt police force. They suggested that they had selected two poor local workers and sacrificed them as scapegoats in order to rid the country of an unsolved murder issue. Having failed to secure the crime scene after the murder, as well as being unable to collect any DNA evidence from the scene, there was very little for the prosecution to confidently claim. The most concrete confession had come from Avanash, but it's suspected that the confession was beaten out of him, in a police force where this is historically known to have happened regularly. After what was hoped would be a short, swift trial, it took the jury a full two months to reach a verdict. In the end, they concluded that Avanash and Sandeep were not guilty of the murder of Michaela Makarivi. Inevitably, this was a devastating blow to John and Michaela's family who were desperately seeking justice. John declared he would continue to fight forever to get justice for his beautiful bride. But despite being reopened on multiple occasions, we still have no definitive conclusion to this terribly sad case more than 10 years later. What was supposed to be the start of a remarkable life together turned into a honeymoon of nightmares that continues to haunt John to this very day.
On December 2nd, 1990, a couple walking along a rural dirt road in McDonald County, Missouri, was collecting cans when they discovered the corpse of a woman near an abandoned farmhouse. They called the authorities and sheriff deputies were sent to the scene where they noted the woman was hogtied using six different types of rope. But her body was so badly decomposed, it was hard to tell much of anything else about the victim or what happened to her. After the initial crime scene investigation, the corpse was sent off for an autopsy, where coroners concluded the body belonged to a white female who was in her mid to late 20s. They also determined the victim was definitely killed by someone else, and she had been lying there outside for about six weeks before her discovery. The different types of rope that were used on the woman included nylon and lead ropes, paracord, clothesline, and coaxial and telephone wires. Detectives were able to determine the paracord to be a military grade type that was only issued to people in the military in the 90s. So the perp was either in the military or knew someone who was. There was also evidence that the victim had been physically violated by a male. Now the trickiest thing about this case is that detectives weren't able to identify who this woman was. She didn't have any personal items on her that would reveal her identity. You know, like those cases where people are found with their ID or passport or something? Sadly, this one wasn't that simple. And officers did the whole look through the missing persons database thing. No matches. At the actual crime scene, there was a whole team of sheriffs, highway patrol officers, anthropologists, and other members of law enforcement, but none of them were able to find any solid clues about the victim or perp. Over the next several years, officers received calls from people across the country calling in tips about the victim's identity. But each time, they'd look up the dental records and test the DNA of the leads, and none of them matched. In the early 2000s, the unknown female corpse was given the name Grace Doe by one of the detectives on the case. The detective said she gave the woman that name because she thought it was only by the grace of God that her true identity would ever be found. In 2009, Grace's remains were sent to the National Missing and Unidentified Persons System for an extensive DNA profile to be created. It was run past all of the profiles in CODIS, or the Combined DNA Index System. No matches. A facial reconstruction was made of Grace and plastered everywhere, and still, no positive IDs were made. At that point, the investigators were beyond defeated. Grace's case was so cold, they just assumed it would never be solved. As sad as it is, there are thousands of homicide cases that go unsolved every year. And based on the lack of evidence or clues, most everyone was convinced Grace's case would be among the ranks. But about 30 years into the case, something crazy happened. So in the fall of 2020, Authram took on Grace's case. Authram is a new tech company that has an advanced forensic laboratory used to ID victims, find missing persons, and track down suspects. The company uses the victim or suspect's DNA and runs the samples past information in ancestry websites to try and find a match or at least a close relative to use as a lead. It's the same way the Golden State Killer was identified in 2018. So Othram thought they could do the same thing with Grace's case. They took her DNA and cleaned it up a bit to create a genetic profile. Specialists then ran Grace's profile through multiple genealogy sites and found several matches for extended family members. From there, the Othram team created a family tree of people Grace might be related to. They gave the list of possible relatives to detectives for them to reach out and see what they could find out. One of the people on the list was a woman named Danielle Pixler. Lieutenant Mike Hall found her number and gave her a call. When the phone rang, Danielle was at work. She picked up the phone and heard some person tell her all about a slaying. They asked her if she had a sister that was missing or something because the DNA of Grace Doe came back as a close match for her DNA. When she first heard all of this, she thought it was a scam. But when Danielle spoke with her family, she realized the call may have been legit. Danielle called Lieutenant Hall back and started bawling. She asked him how he found out about her and knew so much about this relative. She then went on to explain that she had a sister named Shauna Garver. Shauna was in foster care in Kansas and then got transferred back to state care. 
but Danielle had no idea what happened to Shauna after that. For over 28 years, Danielle lived in the unknown about her long lost sister, until this moment. So after Danielle talked to Lieutenant Hall some more, he convinced her to take a DNA test to officially find out if Grace Doe was her missing sister, Shauna. The test came back and Danielle was a match. After nearly 30 years of Danielle searching for her sister and detectives searching for the true identity of Grace Doe, they were both able to find more answers. Now that a positive ID has been made, detectives hope to get down to the bottom of what exactly happened and who did this to Shauna. Officials were able to find out that she had a foster brother named Michael, but he passed away in a car accident in 2000, so not much came from that. Detectives are currently trying to backtrack who Shauna was by talking to her foster parents, searching for information that might help them solve the case entirely. Things like who she lived with in Kansas, what school she went to, the people she hung out with, and so on. To me, it seems like whoever did this to Shauna had to know her. The horrific way she was slain and left to decompose just makes me think someone was out to get her. Maybe a stalker or something? We also know they had to have some sort of tie to the military. But my question is, how did she end up in Missouri? I know those states are right next to each other, but it still makes me wonder what happened there. While the story of Shauna's case is far from over, the fact that a positive ID has been made is quite miraculous. And it's not the only cold case solved by genetic genealogy. Once this new technology was introduced to and utilized in law enforcement, the Metro Denver Crime Stoppers decided to try it out on five cold cases that involved unidentified victims or assailants. There's a former Denver district attorney named Mitch, who started running United Data Connect, a company similar to Othram that tests DNA against ancestry websites to try and identify relatives of unknown individuals. So Mitch, who had experience dealing with some of these cases as a DA, went to the board president of the Metro Denver Crime Stoppers and said, Mike, would you be willing, with your board, to fund five pilot programs around cold cases and genetic genealogy? Mike said, Mitch, that sounds great. So Mike was able to gather $20,000 for United Data Connect to try out as a sort of pilot on five cold cases from the area. First up, I'll tell you about Sylvia Quayle's case. On the morning of August 3rd, 1981, Sylvia was found deceased in her home. She was just 34 years old, and her own father is the one that discovered her. Investigators noted Sylvia wasn't wearing any clothing and had been slashed, strangled, physically violated, and fired at with bullets. At the crime scene, detectives collected 140 pieces of evidence. There was DNA evidence on Sylvia's rug that officials pulled a sample of. Detectives believed this DNA belonged to Sylvia's attacker, and if they determined who it belonged to, an arrest could be made. But that's the thing. They didn't know whose DNA it was at the time. But come 2021, Mitch decided to take on the case. He said, when I read this case and realized that her father found her in the condition that I know she was in, the way that she was left after being brutalized and killed, I can't imagine. As a father myself of a young woman about this age, to have a morning like that. With that, he vowed to do the best he could do to find out who did this to Sylvia using the new genealogy testing. The company took the DNA sample that was collected from the rug all those years ago and got it sequenced. From there, they uploaded the date into two ancestry websites. Then they found relatives of the perp and looked through newspapers and public records to try and narrow things down. Detectives eventually landed on one suspect, a man named David Dwayne Anderson. Investigators tracked him down and were able to snatch two bags of trash he had thrown out. They tested a DNA sample found on a used can of vanilla Coke. And just like that, the case was solved. David was a match for the Coke can DNA. Once the discovery was made, officers arrested David for killing Sylvia. He is still awaiting trial, but he will be charged under the laws that were in place when Sylvia was slain in 1981. That means he's looking at up to life in prison with a possibility of parole after 20 years. If he were charged under today's laws, he'd be facing an automatic life sentence. Here's another story from this batch of cold cases in Colorado. 
One June day in 1993, local authorities were notified about a body found at a makeshift campsite in Douglas County. Just like Grace Doe's case, this woman's corpse was in bad condition, so they couldn't ID her, and detectives weren't able to find any clues at the scene to help them. So she was buried as a Jane Doe, and for years, her case went cold. In 2012, her remains were exhumed for DNA testing. Officials ran the sample through a national DNA database, but there were no matches. The following year, a sketch was made of what Jane Doe may have looked like. No leads. But in 2020, Jane's DNA was tested against Ancestry websites. And thanks to this new way of tracking people down, a match was made. Jane Doe was identified as Becky Redeker, a 20-year-old woman who spent most of her life in Colorado Springs. Investigators have yet to find out who her attacker is, but at least they're able to give Becky's family some closure. And hey, they're one step closer in the process of finding the perp. The last case I'll tell you about today is Helene Przinski's. Helene was a 21-year-old aspiring journalist who attended Wheaton College in Massachusetts. In January of 1980, Helene was doing an internship at a radio station in Denver with her friend and classmate, Kitsy. She and Kitsy were both staying with Helene's aunt and uncle for the internship. On January 16th, Helene's shift ended at 5.30 p.m. Just like every night, she got off and headed home on a route that included walking a few blocks, taking a bus, and walking several more blocks to her family's house, arriving right around 6.30 p.m. This particular night, Helene didn't arrive on time. Her aunt, uncle, and gal pal Kitsy were all super worried. It wasn't like Helene to not come home, especially without giving them a heads up that she was gonna be late or something. The threesome decided to immediately take action. They drove along Helene's route to look for her, searched at the bus stop, and called the radio station she was working at. After no hits, they notified the cops and filed a missing persons report. The following morning, a woman was driving down the road when her 13-year-old son shouted, Mom, there's a body out there. She turned her head and looked out to the field where she saw patches of snow and what appeared to be a body. The woman then found some guy who was driving a big machine along the side of the road and asked him to check it out. The guy approached the body and confirms that it was the body of a lifeless human, so he called 911 to report it. Officers arrived at the scene and determined the woman was Helene. They found her in the field with her hands tied behind her. There were clear signs of her being violated by a male and slashed all over. Investigators collected the perp's DNA samples from Helene's body and clothing, but back then, not much could be done. Here were the other clues found at the crime scene. Tracks in the dirt from a car and cowboy boots, which they made a plaster cast of, an empty milk carton, a piece of bread, and an old can. Once Helene's story hit the news, a woman contacted the police saying she was driving down that road the night of the crime and mentioned seeing a man near the field Helene was found in. The witness said the guy was a white 20 to 30 year old with brown hair and a mustache. She was later brought in for hypnosis where she was able to spill more details about the guy she saw. From that, a suspect sketch was made and released to the public. But if you can't already tell the trend of this episode, this mock-up didn't produce any solid leads. The tricky thing about this case is Helene had only been in Colorado for about two to three weeks for her internship. She was originally from the East Coast. Based on the brutality of this case, it seemed like the assailant would know her well. But two weeks is a short amount of time to become close with anyone. So this was committed by someone at random. A few weeks before this crime, a woman was physically violated by a male close to where Helene was found. Detectives theorized these two attacks were carried out by the same person. Who? They didn't know. In 1998, Douglas County's Sheriff's Office reopened Helene's case. They combed through all of the evidence, and that's when they found out none of it had ever been tested for DNA. So of course, the investigators tested the DNA and ran it through CODIS no match. The case was re-examined in 2000, 2005, 2008, and 2013. But in 2017, the DNA from Helene's case was uploaded into several genealogy websites, and there were a bunch of relative matches. 
From there, officials dwindled things down until they found their suspect, James Clanton. They learned that two years after Helene's slaying, James changed his name to Curtis Allen White. Detectives were able to pull DNA from a beer glass Curtis drank from at a bar, and that's where the speculations were confirmed. This was their dude. In December of 2019, Curtis was arrested. He confessed to the crime within two months, and by July, Curtis went to trial where he pleaded guilty and was sentenced to life in prison. A cold case detective who worked on Helene's case said, we had our traditional techniques that we used and we couldn't get anywhere with those. This new tool gave us the opportunity to reopen the case and identify a suspect. It's been a remarkable tool for detectives to utilize. I feel like everyone's a little bit scared of getting kidnapped, but for Cynthia Anderson, she was paranoid. This 20-year-old woman was constantly harassed with scary anonymous phone calls and creepy love letters in the form of full-on wall murals. It was so bad, she had nightmares about getting abducted almost every night, until one August day when her nightmare became a reality. Cynthia grew up in a devout Christian household with both parents. She was super committed to the Lord. Like she went to Sunday worship, prayer meetings, church swim meets, camping trips, the whole nine yards. She had plans to attend a Christian college in the fall of 1981. It was the same school her boyfriend attended. But sadly, Cynthia never made it there because two weeks before her first semester was supposed to start, she disappeared. Like vanished, never to be seen again. So right now, it seems like nothing sketchy is going on. Maybe she just had enough of the religious lifestyle and wanted to run away and start a new life. I just can't see someone having something against a young Christian girl who was a legal secretary. Like everything about that seems pretty mundane. It's not like she's in the mob or something. But once we get into the story a bit more, things start to get suspicious. Let's see if we can figure out what happened. Cynthia was last seen on August 4th, 1981. That morning, she apparently skipped breakfast and left her parents' house around 8.30. She then drove to work, where she was last seen as late as 9.45 a.m. But no one knew she was missing until noon that day. Cynthia was always the first to show up and would often work alone in the mornings until her coworkers came around lunchtime. Okay, what law office allows their employees to show up at lunchtime? Isn't that weird? I feel like those jobs are the kind where you have to start at like seven in the morning, but whatever, not my business. On the day of Cynthia's disappearance, her coworkers showed up around noon and immediately knew something was off because they couldn't find Cynthia anywhere. They knew she had come in for work that morning because the lights, radio, and AC had been turned on, which was all a part of her morning routine. All of the mail had been put inside the front door and they even saw a book open on her desk. But the weird part about the book is it was a romance novel that only had one violent part in the whole story. And when Cynthia's coworkers found the book, it was open to that exact section, which talked about the main character getting abducted. Okay, that might just be a coincidence, but we've gotta be suspicious of everything at this point. Another weird thing to note about all of this is that the office was locked from the inside when Cynthia's coworkers arrived. Cynthia always kept the door locked when she worked alone in the mornings, so that would make sense except for the fact that Cynthia is missing from the office, but clearly was there that morning. And the alarm from the business next door never went off, which would have happened if someone tried to break in through the door. Uh, this is getting confusing. So maybe someone came in through the window or something? Or Cynthia escaped through the window herself? But Cynthia didn't leave a note or anything. 
which is what she would typically do when stepping out of the office for a bit. At this point, Cynthia's co-workers were pretty concerned, so they called the cops. Officers arrived at the scene to check things out. Oh, there were no signs of forced entry or any sort of struggle. Based on her phone records, officials determined that Cynthia must have disappeared right before 10 a.m because she had answered all calls up until then. The only things that were missing, well, aside from Cynthia, were her purse and keys. But her car was still outside in the parking lot and it was locked. Officers notified Cynthia's parents about her vanishing and they were baffled. Her parents told officials that she wouldn't just disappear like that because she was raised in a strict religious environment. Okay, but how do they know that wasn't a reason she would want to run away? Like, maybe she didn't vibe with the Lord as much as her parents did. Parents don't always know everything about their kids, especially when they're 20 years old. Except for me. I tell my parents everything. During their interviews with the parents, investigators found out that Cynthia had put in her two weeks notice at work because she was about to go to Bible college with her boyfriend. Huh, that's interesting. Maybe someone at work was mad she was leaving and snatched her up? I mean, based on the sound of her co-workers, they seemed a bit lazier than her, so... Maybe they were mad that they might have to start coming in earlier for work. Something Cynthia's dad mentioned to investigators was that his daughter had recently become a little obsessed with her appearance. She was apparently wearing a lot more makeup and was dieting as well. Which doesn't seem that weird to me. Since Cynthia was about to go to college, she was probably just experimenting with her look. I did like the emo swoop once. You know, it's like the... I thought I looked hot. Officials then talked to Cynthia's sister, who brought up something freaky. She said Cynthia had a bunch of bizarre nightmares the whole year leading up to her disappearance. They were all about her getting abducted from her house and executed by a stranger. She apparently told her mom about all of her dreams, but her mom didn't do anything about it. Honestly, from what I've gathered about her parents, they were probably worried Cynthia's nightmares had something to do with the devil. And while it's scary she was having those nightmares, I don't understand how that would connect her to actually getting abducted IRL. Like, I feel like it may be a coincidence, well, unless she was psychic or something, which isn't totally off the table. So all of this is already a bit odd, but just wait until you hear what was happening to Cynthia at her work before her disappearance. According to Cynthia's coworkers, she was getting harassed by an anonymous person who kept calling her phone that summer. No one really knows what the person was saying, but everyone who saw Cynthia when she would pick up the phone for these sketchy calls said she looked super terrified. One of the disturbing phone calls was made the day before she went missing. But again, her coworker who witnessed it said he had no idea what the call was about. Yo, I would be so panicked. Like, I even get freaked out when I get a spam call. And that's literally just an automated message. So it seems like someone was definitely out to get Cynthia, which probably made her nightmares even worse. Aside from the phone calls, some other strange stuff was going down at the law firm. A year before Cynthia went missing, someone painted I love you, Cindy, in super big letters on a wall outside her office. It was signed by GW. The creepy mural was right in the view of the window near Cynthia's desk. Everyone assumed this was about Cynthia because she went by Cindy for short and was the only one with that name on her side of the building. That is terrifying. Why did she not quit earlier? And I don't know if her stalker is trying to make a big romantic gesture or something, but I feel like there's definitely better ways to do that. I could see someone maybe writing her a note on a piece of paper or sending her flowers or something, but to paint a mural on the wall is way too far. Well, unless we're talking about a big flash mob proposal, but her boyfriend apparently didn't have anything to do with his painting. So it's looking more like a predatorial secret admirer. But things get even worse. The message was kept on the wall for six months until it was covered up. And then a few weeks later, someone wrote the same message again. This is getting out of hand. And why would they not paint over that for half a year? 
That had to be so frustrating for Cynthia to be constantly reminded of her stalker. So since the mural was signed by GW, investigators started to question a bunch of people with those initials. There was one maintenance guy with the initials who had access to the office, but there was no evidence found that could link him to Cynthia's disappearance. So due to all of this freaky stuff going on with Cynthia at work, her bosses actually got an emergency buzzer installed at her desk and told her to keep the office doors locked at all times. The buzzer was connected to the business next door, so if Cynthia ever hit it, an alarm would go off over there to call for help. But it never did the morning she vanished. Okay, if things were bad enough for Cynthia's employers to install an emergency buzzer, it seems like they should have let the police know or something. Or at least had her working when other people were there too. Like, why did they let her come in and work alone every morning? It's absurd. Or they could have possibly set her up to get abducted. Who knows at this point? Definitely not the investigators. So after all of their interviews, police were still unable to determine what happened to Cynthia and why she disappeared. One week after the event, the Toledo police received a startling phone call. An unknown woman told officials that someone had abducted Cynthia and was keeping her in her basement. But the woman never revealed her identity, address, or any other information about Cynthia. Whoa, that's crazy. I wonder why she would tell them that and not give them any more clues. And why would she let this person in her basement? That just sounds like she's asking to get abducted too. And maybe she did, which would make sense for ghosting the police after her first call. Okay, so investigators were probably more confused than ever at that point. And after the weird phone call, there were no real advancements made in Cynthia's case. Her social security number was never used by anyone, and her bank account was monitored by the police. But no charges were made after her disappearance. And she apparently had a lot of money, which could be another motive. Money is definitely a reason someone might want Cynthia gone. But then why wouldn't they withdraw anything from her account? That wouldn't make sense. Oh, and there was one other thing that came up in her case after the call. So I already told you about the maintenance guy with the GW initials who was at one point considered a suspect. Well, he was never tied to Cynthia's case, but the person who allegedly wrote the mural came forward later and said he wrote it for another woman named Cindy. Ugh, that's awkward. Because if it really was meant for another girl, Cynthia was put through so much emotional trauma for no reason. But how did they even determine if this guy was telling the truth? Well, the more time that passes, the more mysterious this whole thing gets. Now, it's been 40 years since Cynthia disappeared, and investigators still haven't determined what happened. At one point, they thought it could have been two guys named Richard and Jose. Richard was a lawyer who worked at the law firm when Cynthia disappeared. Jose was one of Richard's clients who just got caught for trafficking substances around that time. In 1996, Richard and Jose were both convicted for working together on a long-time scheme involving illegal substances. Officials theorized that maybe Cynthia overheard the two men talking about their dope conspiracy and they snatched her up so she wouldn't rat them out. And when I say dope conspiracy, I'm talking about substances. I'm not describing it as cool. I just wanna clear that up. Well, apparently they even had a confession from Jose. At his trial in 1995, Jose said he was responsible for slaying Cynthia. He claimed he did it to send a message to Richard for not doing a good job representing him in court. The police were never able to validate this confession, so no charges have been made. But both Richard and Jose are still in jail for their trafficking charges. Okay, I'm no genius, but it sounds like Jose did it. I mean, he even said it himself. Like, what more do you need from a guy? I guess evidence, which investigators found none of, but still, it seems pretty obvious. Another possible suspect duo that police thought could have been involved were famous mass executioners and brothers, Anthony and Nathaniel Cook. 
Their slaying career was at its peak in the 80s, so everyone theorized they did it. But there was never evidence linking them to Cynthia's case. To this day, no one has been convicted or arrested for abducting Cynthia, and no hard evidence has come out to prove she really was snatched up, which is why some people still think she ran away. I mean, it seems like Cynthia's parents were super involved in her life, and at 20, I'm sure that was annoying for her. She also probably wanted a break from all of the church sessions. But then again, if she ran away, why wouldn't she spend any of her money? And how would that explain her stalker situation? That's why I still feel like it was Jose. Ugh, I don't know. This is all super confusing. For all I know, she could have run away to Louisiana to become a full-time gumbo taste tester. Okay, maybe that's just my stomach speaking. Good thing I have a bowl. Thanks for watching.